thank you very much, Hugo. It's a, a pleasure for me to be here also. I always like to come to Sweden, <laughs> uh, as you know, and uh, thank you for the to the organizing committee to, for inviting me. So uh, now I'm in trouble. To <laughs> oh, okay. I think I can manage that. Um, okay. Oh. Okay, so um, uh, what about the? Wh why does the auditory environment matters uh, for preterm uh, infants, and uh, uh, how much are they sensitive to to their acoustic environment? Is is a question uh, that uh, I have addressed during my, my PhD, and um, you know uh, that there are the environment and can affect brain development uh, during critical periods or, uh, of brain development. And these sensitive periods uh, uh, can occur until the age of two years. And uh, of course, um, the period during the third trimester of gestation um, uh, is a period where we, we can act and do something because babies born preterm are in the NICU. Uh, we, how does it work? Um, we know that uh, uh, sensory experiences um, can help to... Uh, the brain is developing through genetically driven uh, uh, process, but also uh, through experiences. And this has been nicely summarized by uh, Knudsen. And uh, one step that is very important is uh, synapse uh, formation and synaptogenesis and synapse elimination. And some during synapse eliminations, some uh, occurs due to highly selective processes. And this is the link between one link between the environment and the brain development because the synapses that are not used are uh, vulnerable and they will disappear uh, during brain development, whereas the other ones that are used will become invulnerable and, and, and remain uh, after. And so if you can uh, uh, Modelize the, the normal brain development in case of a typical experience. You've got this uh, rolling ball, uh, and the, uh, the, the, the straighter the trajectory of the rolling ball, and the the the, the, the softer the the, uh, the the way uh, it takes uh, is 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 linked to a typical experience. But in case of an atypical experience like a deprivation to sensory inputs uh, and in the auditory context uh, deprivation to sounds um, uh, stimuli exposure can lead to language retardation as it has been shown uh, in preterm babies in, in the, the work for Pineda and colleagues. In case of extra stimulation uh, it has been shown also that this atypical difference can uh, modulate and change the normal trajectory of brain development. And um, even if you restore a normal experience, you still have a memory uh, of that trajectory that has been changed. And this has been nicely shown in animals, but also uh, recently in very preterm infants. This is the work from Amir Lav and colleagues that has been published in PNAS. And they, there were two groups of very preterm uh, infants that were with a mean gestational age of 29 weeks. And they were exposed in one group to mother sounds that were recorded mother sounds uh, three hours a day uh, during the first month of life. Uh, whereas the other group was not exposed to any of these sounds, and they, they, they perform a cranial ultrasounds at uh, 30 days of life, and they looked at uh, the anatomical uh, uh, changes that could occur, one in the auditory cortex, is they measured the thickness of the auditory cortex, and they, they took two other brain regions that were not supposed to change due to but that are not related to auditory experience. And one is the, the width of the frontal horn of the, the lateral ventricles and, and the, the width of the body of the corpus callosum. And what we, we, we have shown is that uh, in the group 
who were who was exposed to the maternal sounds, there was a significant increase in the left and the right auditory cortex, whereas there were no changes in the other part of the brain. So suggesting that uh, a non-reached auditory experience could could affect uh, brain anatomical development. So it's still a question about function, but this nicely uh, shown uh, highlight how the environment can affect brain development. So, how is the auditory system of preterm babies? How is it developed? When does it start to work? Uh, we've got lots of data about the anatomical development of the uh, outer and the middle ear and also of the inner ear. And with the cochlea being, being mature uh, roughly around 35 weeks of gestation. But we know also uh, regarding the cochlea that the most important thing, uh, step in that process is the development of the inner air cells and the outer air cells and their connection to the auditory nerve. And we know that these synapses are effective uh, by the 22nd week of gestation, so a long time before birth. And we know also that uh, looking at functions, that uh, these are auditory event-related potentials that were recorded from 25 weeks to, to uh, more than uh, for f until full term. And as you can see, there is a, uh, an increase in the amplitudes of variation and an increase in the latency uh, with uh, development and with, uh, with the age uh, of, a, of, a, of a preterm infants. And so this is linked also to the density of the neurons that are present in the auditory cortex uh, and the synapses, the connections between them. So we know, uh, as for other sensory systems, that the anatomical uh, uh, parts of the auditory cortex are completely formed by the end of the, uh, of the second uh, trimester of gestation, but we can observe the first uh, reaction and responsiveness, uh, responses in fetuses and in newborns by the beginning of the third trimester, and that this perception, uh, uh, we, do, we can record uh, cortical responses uh, uh, to, to these sounds uh, at, at that time using different uh, uh, exploration um, tools. So, but the problem for preterm infants is that we are facing a, an auditory environment that is much different than the one fetuses are uh, encountering in utero. And uh, just to summarize that, of course, uh, you, Christy Moon has nicely shown that uh, uh, fetuses are mainly exposed to maternal sounds um, coming from the, like the mother voices, to some external sounds also, but uh, that are uh, reduced in intensity and maybe in frequency also. And uh, to the opposite, uh, the, the preterm infants are, uh, the auditory system is also exposed to, to very, uh, to, to um, high amount of noise with uh, highly pitched sounds and uh, high, highly intense. And, and uh, this is the case also for over, in other sensory modalities as, as uh, you are all aware of. But, and, and the level, the amount of exposure to maternal sounds and is highly dependent of the developmental care strategies that have been implemented in the, in, in the NICUs and, and especially of skin-to-skin -skin care, which is maybe the only way to restore the sensory discontinuity due to preterm birth. And um, so, of course, uh, many studies have shown that uh, sound pressure levels are, are much higher than the recommendations from the American Association of Pediatrics. This has been shown by Kathleen Philbin and summarized by her. We know also that the sound pressure levels are increasing during the hospital stay, and this was not expected first. We thought that in the NICU it was worse, but uh, this uh, work from uh, Robert Lasky nicely uh, have shown that sound pressure levels are increasing, and that the recommendation of the American Association of Pediatrics are only met 5% of the time. And um, we know also that 
preterm infants are not only exposed to uh, sounds through the air, but also maybe through bone conductions. And this has been nicely shown by Suran Tiran and colleagues who, who put a tiny little probe uh, in the retropharyngeal space of uh, preterm babies, and they measure sound pressure levels uh, uh, in babies on the nasal CPAP. And what they have shown is that they are exposed to much uh, higher sound pressure levels, uh, could reach uh, 100 dBA. Uh, so, uh, and, 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 and these uh, sound pressure levels were related to the flow uh, of the nasal CPAP as it was expected. And uh, so this is uh, um, much higher exposure uh, during uh, li ling lead, uh, linked sorry, to some uh, uh, ventilatory support. So <coughs> now <laughs> I'm going to the question uh, of interest. Uh, what do we know about the responsiveness of our capabilities of perception of the auditory environment of preterm infants? There, since the seminal work of uh, Long and colleagues, we know that, uh, that this was done in two newborns of age uh, 20, 34 weeks uh, uh, at seven days of life. And they nicely shown that when there was an increase in sound pressure levels, there was also a decrease in oxygen, oxygenation measured through uh, transcutaneous uh, uh, sensors, and also an increase in heart rate. Um, and further, some other uh, studies have shown, and this one uh, from Salav Vabiter and, and colleagues, that uh, their preterm infants do exhibit uh, autonomic responses uh, to sounds. And uh, for instance, the, when using skin conductance, uh, they were able to show that after sound peaks of more than 65 dBA in a background noise of 55 dBA, there was a, a significant uh, a changes in the electrodermal response. And this was uh, significant, and this was uh, much more present in male as compared to female uh, babies. We uh, asked that question not only about the, the, the sound pressure levels that were rich, but also regarding the signal to noise ratio, uh, because uh, the, the ambient background noise is uh, also uh, modifying uh, the responses of babies. And so we have recorded uh, the, um, uh, sounds in the, in the isolate of preterm uh, infants and, and, uh, and uh, with a microphone we were able to analyze the sound source um, uh, also. And we recorded uh, in a 10 hours uh, recording session in, uh, per infant in 26 very preterm infants. 60, uh, 600 sound peaks that occur during sleep. And um, uh, we distinguish the ones that were 5 to 10 dBA above background noise and the ones that were higher, 10 to 15 dBA above the background noise. And what we were uh, able to, to see is that there was a significant increase following the sound peaks of heart rate and a significant decrease in the respiratory rate. And also, for the higher sound peaks, a decrease in cerebral oxygenation and systemic oxygenation highlighting that preterm infants did exhibit a stress response with a significant alteration uh, of their physiological well-being. When looking at the sound peaks, also effect, uh, behavioral effect, we were able to, to see that one third of them uh, to one half of them led to uh, awakenings in babies that were sleeping. Uh, so sleep disruptions are also. And um, so maybe it's better to show, to show you a little movie to highlight that. <coughs> I hope it will work. Uh -huh. It works. <laughs> so this is the real life of a baby. Um, so it's not well arranged, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, this is... A and so something occurred. The baby was sleeping and as you can see, the, the, significant signs of withdrawal and the baby is uh, awake, he opening his eyes. As NITCAP observers, you will notice all the withdrawal signs and he tried to self-regulate by grasping uh, something. So 
so no Anovus sounds. This is an opening of sterile bags we are using in the NICU. So if the baby is sitting in the air um, and uh, is, yo uh, uh, is yawning also. So he doesn't seem to like that, of course. And now, uh, there are some other sounds coming. Maybe it's difficult to hear. Some voices from the, maybe the parents around or the caregivers. And you, you see that the baby was in the flex position. It was just opening his eyes. So showing uh, less uh, detrimental effects and more uh, approach, signs of approach. And um, so we, decided after to, to look at the responses uh, regarding, depending on the, about, on the sound sources. And um, much of the sounds uh, peaks that we have recorded were coming from uh, artificial noise, coming from the devices used in the NICU. But some were coming from human voices around. And uh, here are the physiological responses, uh, depending in blue uh, after the human voices and in, in red after uh, artificial sounds. And as you can see, the physiological responses were significantly different with a bidirectional heart rate response with a decrease uh, for some uh, uh, human voices sounds, whereas there was an increase for artificial uh, noise and uh, uh, the same response I already mentioned before. And there was for human voices also a significant increase in respiratory rate. So this argues for the capabilities to distinguish between the, the, the source uh, early on in preterm infants. The, there was a significantly different effect also on sleep disruptions because they were that were much more higher um, uh, after uh, artificial uh, environmental noise exposure as compared to human voices exposure. So. Uh, Sound peaks in the NICU can affect the well-being, physiological and uh, behavioral well-being of preterm infants, but it can also impact on other sensory systems. And this has been nicely shown by a, a group uh, with Fleur Lejeune and, uh, and Frédéric Odehoud and Thierry Debion in Grenoble. Uh, who they have worked a lot on the uh, tactile manual abilities of preterm infants. And they were able to show using a holding uh, habituation disabilitation paradigm that preterm infants were able to recognize the shape and to memorize the shape of an object. And, but this is the case uh, in a silence condition, but it's not anymore the case when at the same time you're presenting the object, uh, there is a noise of 500 hertz. So showing that it could, it could alter uh, multisensory processing uh, in preterm infants. So uh, preterm newborns are attracted to voices and um, they can respond to voice or voices also. And this has been shown also by uh, Betty Vors uh, group and with Melinda Kaske in a very smart study. I think they, they look at the capabilities of preterm babies to develop vocalization early on during the NICU stay. And they, so they recorded uh, sounds uh, nearby the environment, uh, in the nearby environment of preterm infants using a LENA uh, analyzer, which is a, uh, a, a device that is able to count the words around the baby and to distinguish the words and the productions that were made by adults or by the infant. And they did that at 32 and 36 weeks corrected age in a population of very preterm infants. And uh, so we ended up with uh, the fact that preterm infants do vocalize more uh, by the time, with a mean uh, occurrence of vocalization of five per hour at 32 weeks, that, that, that increased to up to 10 per hour at 36 weeks. And uh, there was a, a significant uh, correlation uh, uh, from what is called, maybe I should have mentioned that, uh, they also um, recorded for reciprocal conversation. So that means when uh, a vocalization of a baby occurred in the five seconds following uh, uh, an adult word exposure, or when the baby, when an adult was uh, 
telling something five seconds after a baby has vocalized. And so what we, uh, what, what we sh have shown is also that there, there was some amount of conversation, some reciprocal vocalization between adults and the, the infant, and, and this was more present during when the parents were in the NICU. There was a significant relation between uh, conversational uh, conversations, uh, occurrences, uh, and uh, the visiting time and present, presence time of the parents. And they also follow, I know that this afternoon someone will talk about language development, but uh, I couldn't resist to mention that also, that uh, the more the babies are exposed to adult words, the more they vocalize, and the more they vocalize, the better is their language development measure at 18 months of age. So there is a link between uh, the environment, the exposure, the behavior, and the development after. So preterm infants are able to perceive uh, sounds and vocal sounds at cortical level and to, to they have really fine uh, um, abilities to distinguish uh, word sounds and this has been nicely shown by Fabrice Valois and colleagues from Amiens using a functional near study. And they were able to record cortical responses in 29 weeks uh, uh, after uh, discrimination tasks where babies were exposed to ba, 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 ga. And they recorded uh, like a mismatch uh, a paradigm and they recorded uh, significant responses uh, in the auditory uh, loop uh, of the brain of preterm infants starting from 29 weeks uh, um, uh, corrected age. So, <coughs> when looking uh, at the, I mean, the intensity of, uh, of uh, <laughs> this infant um, uh, uh, is looking for, for someone, is looking for his mother, uh, because it's a little boy, <laughs> uh, yeah, to, uh, born at 28 weeks uh, of gestation uh, in the age. And uh, we know, of course, that uh, uh, they are seeking social interactions and maybe the best way to, to, to offer that is skin to skin. So the question is now t for me to, to, look at, uh, to, to talk about what we know about the perception of the mother's voice in preterm infants. So I want go too, too deep in what you have already nicely shown and discuss that fetuses are attracted to, to their own mother's voice uh, and that they can or orient towards their, 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 their voices. And when, when, one type of response that has been recorded in fetuses in the, is the orienting cardiac reflex, where there is a significant decrease in heart rate during the stimuli presentation. And this has been shown by Le Canuet and colleagues in, in Paris. We know, uh, as you have shown, that full-term newborn, of course, do orient to their mother's voice. And the question, uh, using this uh, <laughs> uh, paradigm uh, that Bill Pfeiffer and Tony, Gasp Tony de Casper has used, and, but the question is, how does it uh, develop in very preterm infants that were separated from their mother's uh, uh, belly uh, for maybe several weeks? And so we, we tried to address that question, um, and we followed in a longitudinal study, follow-up study, very preterm infants uh, that were 30 uh, born below, 32 weeks of gestation, and we record them at 30 to 32 postmenstrual age, and again at 34 to 36 postmenstrual age. And we expose them, uh, based on the previous study I have just shown to you, uh, to, to a, a five-second sentence uh, uh, told by the mother, and the, mother, the, the sentence in, in French is Mon petit bébé, il est l'heure de dormir maintenant, calmement, tranquillement. So in English, it is My little baby, it's time to sleep now, quietly, peacefully. And so we ask the mother to say it, and we record it. Mon petit bébé, il est l'heure de dormir maintenant, calmement, tranquillement. So the mother is using a emotional and motherish language. And this is the one from uh, uh, another mother. Of course, it couldn't have been reversed because we used the previous mother as the stranger mother for the next baby. 
Mon petit bébé, il est l'heure de dormir maintenant, calmement, tranquillement. So mother or little they are singing also, and we 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 use also uh, uh, another uh, female uh, voices, but it was a, a very nice colleague in my in my in my lab. So I just mentioned that before you hear her, because we ask her to not to just to 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 be, to be neutral and uh, without emotion. But she's very nice, huh? believe me. Mon petit bébé, il est l'heure de dormir maintenant, calmement, tranquillement. You see the difference. <laughs> Okay, and so we we uh, we recorded the heart rate and uh, uh, some of the physiological and behavioral uh, data and um, uh, during that presentation, and so this is what uh, we obtain in black in the period of 30 to 32 weeks and in blue. Uh, uh, from 34 to 36 weeks, in, in this is the average of all the responses of all the babies included. Mon petit bébé, il est l'heure de dormir maintenant, calmement, tranquillement. So by five seconds time periods, you can see that from 30 to 32 weeks, there is a significant increase in heart rates, arguing for uh, capabilities to, to, to detect the mother's voice. But uh, from 34 weeks of uh, postmenstrual age, there is a significant decrease during the stimulus presentation, like the orienting cardiac reflex that has been shown already in fetuses. And this uh, decrease in heart rate was only present for the own mother's voice of a baby, and not for the other one in, in, in brown, uh, in black, and not for my colleague uh, voice <laughs> uh, in, in, in brown, uh, as you can see. So. Uh, this data highlight that preterm babies uh, early on can orient toward their own mother's voice. And um, uh, so they have the capability to, to recognize it and to memorize it. This, this data are uh, suggesting that. So, and this is truly in line with uh, that what has been shown in, uh, uh, in fetuses. Uh, so, so this is a, um, a team in, uh, in Lille, uh, and they have used a functional MRI during pregnancy, and they were able to record responses in the brain uh, after mother's voice exposure, exposure to an unfamiliar voice, and also to pure tones. And what they were able to, to, sh to see is that uh, um, preterm, uh, full term, no, fetuses uh, were uh, able to activate specific brain areas for voices, but there was a specific activation for the mother's voice starting at 33 to 34 weeks in fetuses. So this is truly in line with what we have uh, uh, shown. And maybe I won't speak because Manuela Filippa will talk about. Uh, uh, early vocal, uh, maternal vocal, uh, and the effect at, uh, of, of this intervention. So, so, but there are other data that you will hear this afternoon uh, in line with these results. So, and this is also what is known in um, in full-term newborns uh, that there is a specific act. There are specific activation uh, in the brain uh, of um, uh, full-term newborns uh, uh, for the mother's voice, and this is a mismatch negativity paradigm in an event-related potential uh, study. And uh, this is the res these are the responses for the mother, and these are for the stranger, and this is, this is the differences of. Uh, neurophysiological responses. And uh, as you can see, there are specific activation in the brain, f specifically for the mother's voice, starting at birth. And um, uh, this has been also uh, shown in um, fMRI study and studies using MRI evaluating the connectivity of the brain. And um, uh, there are specific activation in the uh, superior temporal sulcus and Broca's area that are present all, uh, all, um, uh, f from, from, from birth in newborns, and these are uh, very similar to what is uh, observed in adults. Just one word about music. I don't know whether I have time still. No, I didn't see any. One minute, okay. So, <laughs> I shouldn't have asked. <laughs> uh, so, so um, uh, this study in preterm newborns uh, want, wanted to evaluate the impact of a musical experience during 30 minutes. 
and this the music experience was just a female voice singing with a very not complex uh, music, just a harp, and uh, the responses were measured in in preterm infants uh, of more than 32 weeks of gestational age, and uh, what this data here of the heart rate and here of the behavioral responses are showing is that during the musical experience there were no, no, no differences between uh, live music, recorded music and no music uh, in the same group of infants, but after the 30 minutes following the end of the music uh, uh, session, there was a significant decrease in heart rate and uh, significantly more quiet sleep just for live music and not for recorded music. So, altogether, uh, this is maybe the end. <laughs> uh, what, what can we recommend uh, based on, on, on the, what we know about the auditory sensitivity of preterm infants? Of course, I, I, we have to avoid and to lessen sound peaks around the, the infants and specifically the ones coming from devices and in the NICU. So we have to apply noise criteria to to, to choose uh, new materials and uh, we have to change the practice and we have to modify the architecture to, to, to have a, a friendly acoustic NICU environment. But also we have to provide, uh, to increase the exposure to maternal, paternal, and parental and human voices and the best maybe strategy is to provide skin-to-skin -skin care, contact in a quiet environment where, uh, of course, here in Sweden, <laughs> parents are considered as uh, primary caregivers and they should be encouraged to talk to their infants, uh, but also uh, to adjust that to the infant's cues, uh, not to overwhelm the baby, as it has been nicely uh, shown in, uh, by uh, Karl Rombo uh, at the beginning of that session. So uh, I uh, hope I have convinced you that very preterm infants are uh, sensitive to their NICU auditory environment, that we should protect them and continue to protect them to, from auditory stressors, but we have also to support access to biologically meaningful stimuli like the, their own mother's voice. We have to individualize that, and so in the NITCAP environment, it's a uh, context, it's, it's easier. And uh, that uh, early maternal vo vocal contact that you will uh, hear more about uh, later on this day is uh, an opportunity to, to provide a more auditory nurturing environment for preterm infants. So thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>